This was a fascinating conversation with Zubin Damania, aka ZDog MD, the Stanford trained doctor who's become something of a major online medical voice during COVID. He's also a deep thinker with a keen interest in spirituality and awakening, and has also experienced firsthand the online wars over medical information and censorship. YouTube comes in and says, this is misinformation. Here are links to real information. And they, what's crazy, David, is they've done this to my videos on both ends of this. So they've labeled my own videos as misinformation, and then they've used my videos as the link when they label other people's videos misinformation. And I'm like, so it just goes to show that they, they cannot arbitrate. And he's also thought a lot about how polarized and politicized it's become and how difficult it is to find truth online. We're all biased creatures. We're all tribal. We're all victims of um, these hyper stimulating technologies like social media that pit us against each other for uh, in a way of hacking our evolution to do that. And I think if we can at least step back and say, ah, maybe there's a higher way to look at this. You can still be passionate, you can still be persuasive, but you can recognize when you have bias and actually be willing to be challenged, to challenge others. We all have the goal of like trying to help people, I think. We should assume good intent in most, most cases, right? Which is another thing we don't do. And recognize that everyone has these different moral palettes and that they're acting in a way they think is good. So please don't attack their goodness. Um, you can attack ideas in a respectful way, but so, I think if we get to that level, we'll see that next evolution is just gonna catalyze. You'll see a phase shift. And then we'll be in a place where we'll be looking back on this going, man, remember when it was such a shit show? So Zubin Damania, welcome. Great to be here. Awesome. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation. We've already caught up a little bit offline. And I first became aware of your work, I think very early in COVID. I'm gonna play a little clip from that now because it was an amazing rant about how COVID was gonna impact or how you hoped COVID would impact the medical system. As clinicians, as the tribe of healthcare, COVID-19 will be the catalyst that burns this broken system to the ground. This is the end of it and I'll tell you why. We on the front lines of healthcare will hold every single leader accountable when this is over. And why do I say when this is over? Because now we're doing what we do to save lives with no support, no protection. And when we speak out, what happens? You're fired. And what I really loved about that is we've talked a lot here about game B. Game B being a kind of placeholder for what's next. And game A is like the game theoretic dynamics that are the problem with the current system. And I thought in that piece, you perfectly articulated what I'd call like the game A dynamics within healthcare and then sketched out, and I know you've talked about healthcare 3.0 as being a potential new system for healthcare, which is how does corporate capture affect healthcare? How does the hollowing out of an innate human sacred calling and the monetization or the kind of manipulation of that, what does that do to healthcare? And you really articulated that beautifully. I guess I'd like to start with recapping that, maybe looking back to when that was published, and do you think it's had that effect? And what were you trying to articulate through it? You know, the, at that time, you know, my colleagues and, 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 and everybody were going through this acute event where they had no protection, they had no PPE, they had no support. Administrators were saying, don't wear masks on the floors because we don't wanna make our patients nervous. Um, and there was this general sense that we are sacrificial lambs. Now, that would have been all fine and dandy if we signed up to do that, which many of us did. We're like, well, we're here to actually help other people. But if we hadn't been constantly morally injured up to that point by the changes in healthcare that were turning it from this relationship-based sort of sacred calling where you're with somebody when they're at their most vulnerable. And, and the amazing magic there is they let you, like they let you into that space. And that connection, that we space that you create is 90% of the healing, all the tools and all the other stuff is just kind of window dressing on that, right? But that's been chipped away by what I call health 2.0. So if that was health 1.0, this old paternalistic system of doctor and patient in a sacred relationship that was unfettered by bureaucratic intrusion, it was also unfettered by a whole lot of science, 
thinking about bigger picture populations, uh, wondering about why there's so much unexplained care variation between one doctor and another, where like across the street, you get a totally different kind of care because there's no standardization, no guidelines, really no evidence-based practice. And the paternalism of doctors saying, oh, you just do this, just listen to me and don't worry about anything else because there was no internet. So that was sort of subsumed or is in the process of being you know, replaced by health 2.0, which is this, oh, well, let's look at the carrots and sticks of business and incentives and evidence-based randomized control trials and corporate takeover of medicine because we wanna treat it like a business because business is efficient and we know capitalism works. So therefore it should apply to medicine. And then you can treat medicine kind of like Toyota treats an assembly line, optimize each process of it, use this thing called lean, where you optimize every part of the assembly line and look at your inputs and your outputs and so on. And that emerged in electronic health record and these other technological innovations that were supposed to make things better. What it end up, ended up doing was corporatizing medicine. So now you have private equity in the United States owning a lot of medicine forcing a profit incentive and a business incentive into what was otherwise this relationship driven thing and turning both caregivers and patients into commodities. Now that's the system we're in. That's inflicting what I call moral injury on, on everybody. It's, it's saying, oh, we now have to serve these multiple masters. We have to serve our employer that has one set of incentives. We have to serve our loan officer who we have to pay back for our medical school debt. We have to serve our patient, which is a whole different thing. And we have to serve ourselves and our family. And those are at odds, which create a kind of conflict, a kind of injury, the end stage of which is what they call burnout. So already we were in this burned out end stage for many people. 60% of physicians in the US won't recommend the career to their kids. Then the pandemic hits. And what you see is these administrators, the, the structures of power that were, were pitching us, we're the ones that will improve efficiency, will make us ready to fight anything, fell apart, could not do the one job they had, which is to keep us safe and to give us the tools, resources, and autonomy to care for other human beings. They failed and that generated tremendous anger and despair, I think, across healthcare. And do you think that that has, um... Because in, in in the piece that you that you recorded, you were kind of saying, "This is the end. This is going to be the kind of straw that breaks the camel's back." Is that the case? Do you think now, looking back? You know, I I'll tell you this. I sure hope that was the case, and I felt it in the moment that this is the end because we will never tolerate this. I think you underestimate the entrenched inertia of a group of human beings, all of our healthcare people who have been conditioned since the beginning of their training to obey authority, to obey hierarchy, and to not try to innovate or change because we've been taught that that could kill people. And so even when faced with an existential threat like the pandemic, uh, and uh, we retreat back into the safety of what's known. However, the cracks are now quite apparent and as is happening, I think in society at large, what's happening is a lot of doctors and nurses and nutritionists and physical therapists are waking up and going, wait, wait, who am I? How am I part of this? This pandemic has allowed me to turn the lens back at myself and see that my own mental health has been suffering. And as we wake up, as we start to transform ourselves internally, systems tend to transform, maybe even if it's one funeral at a time as the old guard starts to die off and new, new people fill uh, that space. Yeah, and in this conversation, what I really am looking forward to covering, you're, you're a medical communicator, um, and my, as a journalist, my real interest and my I guess obsession, which has been kind of extenuated by COVID and what I've seen happen to the information landscape, is this sense of different ecosystems of information, um, different narratives competing or not even competing, sort of the, the way that a lot of what was a kind of very fragmented information ecology or information landscape beforehand, a lot of that has been accelerated during COVID because a lot of this, a lot of, um, a lot of the information has become like literally life and death. Like if we're talking about medical matters, there's a there's an extra layer of kind of jeopardy to it, which has accelerated a lot of censorship. It's accelerated a lot of um, groupthink, a lot of consensus, and a lot of alternative narratives as well that I don't see 
I, I don't see any kind of healthy place where they come together, and we'll come to that in a minute. Um, but why I was really excited to talk to you was I noticed that you were using a lot of language in some of your films that I was familiar with. You, talk, you're, you were using a lot of language from Jonathan Haidt talking about the moral taste buds. I was getting echoes of like Ken Wilber integral thinking, and then that was confirmed when we caught, caught up um, uh, last week. You, you mentioned that you were kind of very familiar with that, with that background. And I think that feels quite unique. Um, you talk about kind of each viewpoint being true but partial, and so you've got a lot of that kind of background as well. And then also recently I noticed you started doing films about awakening. Um, so there's so many different overlaps in terms of what we cover on Rebel Wisdom and what your, your background seems to be. Um, before we go into the kind of the, the, the information landscape, how would you like to respond to that? What's, what's the th stuff about Awakening that you're making films about now? It, it, it's really interesting because I think a lot of what I'm doing now kind of recapitulates evolutionary stages as described by people like Ken Wilber. You know, when I was young, I was very, I had magical thinking, you know, I'm a Zoroastrian, which is this ancient religion. And you go through the equivalent of a bar mitzvah, they're, you know, they're from Persia in, originally and then India more lately. And, you know, I, I really thought there was a mythic magic God that controlled everything. And if I prayed to it, things would happen magically for me, the separate me. And then became very science-minded in, in my teenage years, became an atheist, went to you know UC Berkeley, UCSF for medical school, Stanford for my internal medicine residency training, and was indoctrinated and conditioned in the scientific worldview to the point where it's a kind of religion, it's scientism. And there wasn't a lot of dissent because in those days too, this is the 90s, the internet was brand new. The tribalization, the splinterization of truth wasn't really there. So the truth was one monolithic thing, which is you give this drug, it binds to this receptor, people get better or worse. The side effects are something that are just due to complexity. And we don't understand mind-body connection because there's no mind apart from the body. The body emerges a mind. and so. As my own journey unfolded and I started waking up and meditating and having my own crisis of confidence in scientism, I realized you can actually transcend and include science, but there's something bigger than that. And that was this idea of who are we? What, what is our fundamental identity? And when you start to look at that and you realize this, this idea that there's this little self behind my head who is a moral agent, an actor of, of my own destiny, boy, it's hard to find that when you look for it in the present moment. And when that happens, you start to realize, oh, this idea that there are, there are true but partial viewpoints almost everywhere. And how we parse them is through our own conditioning, our own moral matrix as Haidt describes. And could we actually see some beauty and truth in everything? So again, then your own politics evolve. You go from whatever you were before to seeing the other side as less evil and less enemy as more, oh, these are humans with a different moral matrix. And actually I'm sympathetic to some of their moral matrix and then emerging something that's really bigger than the sum of the parts. And so that was the kind of journey. So now talking about awakening for me is like a priority because I feel like if humans start to look, turn that lens of attention inwards, um, they start to transform their own understanding of what they are, which then transforms as an epiphenomenon our human systems. And I, I think that's why, your earlier question of, I mean, do you think this is going to change? Are, 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 is that, is, are we going to get to game B? You talked about game A. It's like, well, yeah, because this is going to trigger more of this human transformation, which will then emerge game B, which we don't fully know what it looks like because it, it's beyond our conception at this stage of our evolution. But suddenly it will, it will start to click. You know, in the way that Daniel Schmachtenberg, Schmachtenberger, is it? I think he was on your show. He, talked about it, this caterpillar going to chrysalis, going to butterfly, they look very different from each other and it's almost a phase shift in what changes. And I think awakening is a necessary but not sufficient part of that phase shift. I'd like to go into the stuff that we've been talking about a little bit offline about the information ecology. And I'm gonna go in um, hard, I guess, because I've been watching and kind of being very concerned about this kind of split and and in particular the level of misplaced certainty and the level of passion and the level of um just real yeah a, a real sense of how much intensity there is around a lot of these topics i mean we, we can talk about kind of 
concerns about the vaccines, or we can talk about kind of the current situation with Eva Mectin, you can talk about all of these different topics, which I'd love to explore with you. Um, but, I, but I started with, um, with the, the clip about the, where you were talking about kind of the, what the problems with the medical system. Because I want to start straight away by saying I saw some of the comments under some of your other videos where you're talked about as kind of a, a big pharma shill or someone who's basically in the can for the status quo, for the consensus. Um, and I wanted to kind of get your response to that because my take from seeing the video that you, that you put out and my understanding about your concept of health 3.0 is that's kind of the opposite of your, your basic orientation in terms of the, the medical industry. It's interesting because, you know, I had a lot of pharmaceutical influence when I was training at Stanford because Pfizer would sponsor our, our uh, lunches every week where we got teaching on whatever subject. So the Pfizer rep was there teaching us, hey, have you tried Norvask for hypertension? It's Here's a study that shows it's 0.0000001% better than the generic you know, competing drug. And so you guys should all give it. And, you know, we were all buddies with the Pfizer rep. And so that influence is absolutely real. If you get a free lunch from anybody, it it affects you. And my, my colleague Vinay Prasad has written about this extensively. So to say that I'm uninfluenced historically by pharmaceutical uh, uh, pressure is, it would be a lie. However, <laughs> once you recognize that influence and you realize, okay, so, now what, right? Let's look at the pros and cons of pharma. I have good friends who work in the research end of pharma doing beautiful work. And I have colleagues who work in the marketing side and it's gross, it's disgusting, direct to consumer advertising. And the profit motive of pharma is very disintermediated from doing good in the world, honestly. I have strong opinions about this. And so I also feel like we are quite reductionist. So when you're looking at, well, am I a pharma shill? Well, do I take money from pharma? The answer is, well, I did a talk for AbV back in the day for their uh, group and I've said, okay, here's what Health 3.0 is. That was the talk I did. And so, yeah, I took that money and I did it for another uh, pharma group as well, teaching them about what I call Health 3.0. But other than that, I don't take a dime from them. When I talk about vaccines, I'm talking about it from, first of all, clinical experience and then looking at the science, but they don't pay me to do this. So this idea of being a shill means you're promoting their party line for money. You're selling something because you're getting some benefit from it. But I just don't see how that relates to me. And in fact, I've criticized pharma. I've made parodies about pharma uh, that are parodies of, um, of Hamilton uh, about King Pharma and, and how he price gouges. But they won't look at that when they look at that because they have an idea of who this guy is because I'm saying things that are antithetical to what their tribal belief structure is. So, and I get that, I totally get it. And what do you see as the dangers of kind of big pharma in, currently in, in terms of kind of the landscape we're seeing around COVID, the vaccines and, and yeah. The, the, I mean, they've, they've got increased power. I know this is something that... Um, a friend of mine talked about is that pharma were not really at the big table for quite a while because a lot of their drugs were becoming a lot less um, potent. The, the, like the pipeline for a lot of effective drugs, if you look at antidepressants and many of those other ones, they kind of dried up and suddenly with vaccines, they're now back at the big table. So you've got to assume that with that level of power and that level of um, influence, you've, you've got to be wary of and, and aware of kind of what other agendas might be there. They are driving the boat in this country as far as FDA. They, there's so much government common money going into this that's being funneled into pharma. It's, it's a dream for pharma, right? And so if you don't question that, if you just roll over and go, well, then everything will be good. I'm just gonna, you know, they're talking about giving kids the vaccine now. It sounds good. It sounds like FDA's on board, emergency use authorization. Let's just go with that. You better question that when you're giving a, a vaccine to a low risk population, right? And, and see, I can get censored by YouTube just for saying that. So we have to talk about that at some point, but the bottom line is you better question what's going on. And we do, and I have guests on my show who question everything 
including their own belief structure. And so if you watch my own evolution throughout the pandemic, you see my beliefs on many things are questioned and changed. There's skepticism about the vaccine before it came out. Like this can't happen. There's no way. Here's all the things that could go wrong. Then you show me the data and I go, well, the things that I thought would go wrong didn't. I have these other questions. Oh, those were answered. Okay, good. Well, I got the vaccine. My family got the vaccine. We're doing okay. I'm looking at the data. There are these case reports. Okay, what's that? Let's look at that. And so that's that's how you have to question these things. You have to be empirical. You have to keep looking, keep updating your prior assumptions based on new data. But we're very reluctant to do that because if it triggers something that opposes our own underlying belief, our unconscious belief, what Haidt calls the elephant, this unconscious part of our mind, what, you know, what Daniel Kahneman calls system one, this, you know, instinctive piece you're gonna have a hell of a time uh, overcoming that bias and you're gonna try to cherry pick information online to support the bias. And that's what I see happening everywhere. And it occurs to me too, but then I try to catch it. I'm not always successful, but I do my best. And I try to teach how we might be able to do that, which is part of our kind of structured philosophy. Yeah, and I mean, you touched on it already, the, the way that the big tech platforms are starting to police this conversation, and police this debate. Which is, which just seems insane, on the face of it, that talking about ivermectin, for example, would get you banned, or talking about the lab leak theory would would have got you banned up until like a few weeks ago. Um, what do you make of that kind of the way that the big tech platforms are trying to to regulate the discussion? If you if you want a surefire formula on how to further tribalize, create a victim mentality in the people pushing this information. Uh, this is the way to do it. <clears throat> Take a big tech platform that has a practical monopoly upon which many of the creators who are pushing this stuff are financially dependent. So, you know, I generate revenue through ads on Facebook, YouTube, et cetera, through subscriptions for people who subscribe to my show to get, you know, this kind of more one-on-one -on -one discussions with me. I'm dependent on these platforms for revenue, right? That's my bias. So it's kind of like, well, if they can if they decide to demonetize a video, that's equivalent to taking it down because it also doesn't serve as much. It doesn't reach as many people because of their algorithms. Demonetized videos just don't get out there as much. So it's effectively like a shadow ban at that point. So when you do that to people online, let's talk about the Ivermectin guys, right? It's a crew of people. They are suddenly labeled as misinformation, which by the way, who's arbitrating that? Like, it, it, so where is the single source of knowledge, right? Well, well, okay, it's CDC, but well, but CDC changes its opinions. There's no reason that you can't go out and say, hey, I think ivermectin's a miracle drug and here's the data. And then other people can come and say, hey, never use that term miracle drug because it literally means you're insane. Like it's an opinion and your data is garbage data. So, but why? Well then sit down and let's talk about it in good faith. Like there's no reason you can't do that. Instead, YouTube comes in and says, this is misinformation. Here are links to real information. And they, what's crazy, David, is they've done this to my videos on both ends of this. So they've labeled my own videos as misinformation and then they've used my videos as the link when they label other people's videos misinformation. And I'm like, so it just goes to show that they, they cannot arbitrate. Yeah, I mean, this is my take on it. Like. There's obviously outrage about the big tech platforms deplatforming people, banning videos, and it's very, I think everyone agrees that that shouldn't be their role. But for me, that whole conversation is a symptom of a wider disconnect in the information ecology, which is that I don't see anywhere where, because by definition, the truth starts as heterodox. It starts as challenging consensus. It starts as challenging the status quo. And the big tech platforms can't tell the difference between something that's heterodox and something that's kind of misinformation or reprehensible or whatever. So the way that that should be resolved is by those, is having the conversation, is by having the debate. Um, but what I see happening at the moment is that the alternative only exists on alternative platforms. The mainstream is basically still trying to play this old, old game of that person's beyond the pale, that person's a crank, we're not gonna platform them because that would give a kind of false equivalence. Therefore, those, those ideas are not being challenged and they generally only turn up on alternative podcasts or alternative platforms where there is no incentive to challenge them. 
So you've got this kind of very broken information ecology where it's what I've called the uncanny valley between the two, two narratives. And I, that's what terrifies me at the moment about, um, yeah, about this uncanny valley opening up. And I don't, I don't really see an easy solution to it. The, 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 I think your assessment of that is spot on. And, and it's interesting because you can see it play out. It, I used to be, and I've had to evolve my own belief structure on false equivalence. False equivalence meaning you give somebody a platform that's a crank and you elevate them to the status of a you know, scientist or whatever. And it used to be if there was no alternative platforms, then that may be true, right? But now it's like anybody with any thing behind their name can go out and make a video and claim to be an expert, may even have some mild expertise in something and have the equivalence to somebody who studies it all their lives. And, and then when you watch the response to it, it is completely secularized off and tribalized and siloized. So a good example is, you know, early in the pandemic, there was this, um, uh, and, and it continues actually, this kind of idea that Fauci actually created the virus in order to make money. It was a plandemic. That was the term. And Judy Mikovits and you know these guys were hailed as these hero scientists who were blowing the whistle. Well, when you actually look at who she is, you know she. I did a whole video on this, basically debunking this thing point by point because just in terms of facts. It doesn't make sense. In terms of logic, it doesn't make sense. It's wrapped in conspiracy. There's moving goalposts. Anytime you tell them this, they move the goalpost further back. Well, then you gotta prove it this way. So a lot of like logical fallacies, all this other, so these signs of kind of misinformation. So I did a video where I ranted and raved about that. <clears throat> and um, if you look at the comments for the video, they are, it's almost like you're living in two different worlds. So I happen to know the general community and the scientific community. They look at the pandemic thing and they're like, oh, this is just insanity. You wouldn't even talk about it. You look at the comments on my video, it's like this bald pharma shill is wrong and Judy Mikovits is a hero or who's he paid by, you know, like just, you would think is just crazy. But in reality, it's the information ecology splintered into tribal factions that have no interest in actual truth. They have interest in the tribal badge of belief that they are gonna defend to the death because that gives them the inclusion in this group. And I saw that and I said, oh, this is interesting. Now this is interesting. And, um, and, and I think it's what you're pointing at, it, th th this inability, this uncanny valley, as you call it, between, okay, here's truth and here's truth seeking. And then here's what's actually happening in the world where you can have one podcast saying this thing and another podcast saying the diametric opposite and the two never having a proper interface with good faith debate or discussion, but instead just painting the others as villains. And then two groups of people who believe entirely different things, diametrically opposed, incompatible beliefs, um, which they both can't be true. And yet here we are. Yeah, I mean, that's the, the central problem I think is that we're not gonna find truth without a functioning marketplace of ideas. And that marketplace of ideas is broken on both sides. It's broken on the mainstream side because I think they still have this sort of belief that they can gatekeep the conversation. Whereas that, that horse has bolted. Like you can't say, well, this person is a fringe person. It's like once, they, once they're out there, they're out there. And then, but I don't see anywhere that's trying to bring those two narratives together. For example, to challenge, um, because the incentive structure on the alternative is generally not to challenge. And I don't think people really understand this because I think most people on YouTube are mostly focused on censorship or no censorship. And that's where the conversation breaks down. It's like, it tends to be mostly just about the big tech platforms and we can all get behind the big tech platforms shouldn't be censoring people. The, 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 the wider conversation about why the, why the marketplace of ideas has broken down at a much deeper level, I think is, so the, the the big tech platform is banning people is a kind of symptom of that failure rather than a cause, or it, it feeds into that as a cause, but it's, it's largely a symptom of the fact that we don't have any way of adjudicating truth claims anymore. Like we, 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 that whole system has, has broken completely. And I think there's, there's fault on both sides because of that. Uh, th that is exactly, I think, 
if I could define a mission statement for what we're trying to do, and we don't always succeed because I'm victim to my own biases often and fall into the trap of ranting and raving, but when I'm at my best, which is again, rare, the, the idea is you're a bridge between ideas to try to see where is the nuance, what's true but partial, and what can we as independent actors try to glean from it. And so a lot of the messages I get when it goes right is, you know, thank you for helping me navigate the sea of lunacy on all sides. There's a Fauci extreme, and then there's the Judy Mikovits extreme. Uh, there's the ivermectin, and then there's the pharma, uh, you know, mRNA vaccines extreme. And and the truth is, if you will you will get a lot farther in, th in your thinking and in your communication, if you actually acknowledge that there's some truth on all the sides of these, instead of just branding somebody as, as crazy. And, and I, think, um, <clears throat> I think we don't do that. Scientists are not really good at doing that. And, and another reason for that, that we see in the pandemic that I think is quite interesting in this information breakdown is that there's a distinction that we brought up on the show between public health messaging and scientific discourse. And they're different in the sense that once public health determines, okay, this is what this is the science we want to go with, we have to communicate it in a monolithic black and white way without nuance because otherwise people won't get it and there'll be you know doubt and all this. So they do that. But the problem is in the current e information ecology, there's a lot of nuanced opinions out there and there's a lot of other black and white opinions that disagree with this narrative. And so it butts up against that. And then you have YouTube saying, we're going with public health, we're gonna, silence these new other you know heterodox opinions or misinformation we can't tell the difference right as you say and then what that does is it creates distrust of the public health apparatus which is a natural human response but scientific discourse is to throw feces at each other to challenge each other to to really get in it and go you know what now like the ivermectin guys hey look at all this data and then the other guys going wow but the data's low quality and you're confusing correlation with causation no we're not look at this data well but that data has this flaw oh but well then look at this meta analysis of the data well you're just combining a bunch of different trials that have flaws but that's not true because you're biased because of your financial incentive that's the conversation you should have like, why would you silence the ivermectin side? That's crazy. Have the conversation and then ha maybe have an adjudicator. There need to be people that are these agents that say, okay, let's really bring people together that, and we're gonna act in good faith and we're gonna talk about this and show it to the public so the public can make educated decisions based on what they value. I wanna challenge you a little bit because I did see a video of yours where you pretty much kind of drew the line at anti-vax talk and yeah. said, because because I, I having talked to you and seen a lot of your stuff, like I think you do walk the walk on um, trying to persuade. But I've also saw seen this film and it's been referenced to me by by others saying that it, it just felt very closed minded. It felt like you were kind of like, OK, I'm not going to I'm not going to even talk to anti-vaxxers anymore. Yeah. I'm so glad you brought that up because I look at that. That was a couple, three years ago or something um, before the pandemic. Yeah. Maybe even maybe even before that, because it was before the pandemic. It was the one where it said, I I no longer will tolerate anti-vaxxers. It's just me talking at the camera, right? Uh, something like that. Yeah, yeah. And you correct me if I'm wrong. If I did it during the pandemic, uh, correct me. That was an so that was a great example of where bias and close-mindedness and a failure to recognize to a failure to be that adjudicator. It just manifested in me. And that's where all my conditioning, and I'll tell you why, it came from an emotional place. So this was pre-pandemic and I was seeing people saying, okay, these vaccines are, are you, you can't give them to kids and it's gonna, and then I see the kids getting measles and getting pertussis and having these things happen. And it was right after I had a vaccine expert on my show and some anti-vax activists actually came to the studio and started banging on the, on the, glass shouting obscenities at us while we were broadcasting. And I said, wow, they found us. We don't have a published address. They literally stalked us, found us and tried to interrupt our show. And so the next day or two days after that, I did this video and I said, I have had it with these people. They don't get my platform. They don't get to leave comments here. They don't get to have a voice on my platform because if that's how they behave, forget about it. We're done with it and it's over. And listen, if I had to do, I would never make that video today. 
right? That was the sum total of all my experience at that point. And I recognize it and go, no. So now when I talk about it, my, my language is completely different. And in fact, I've had anti-vaxxers join my paying supporter group because they said, you know what? I get the sense of who you are now. I hated you. I despised you. You were awful. And now I understand that you actually are sympathetic to a lot of our concerns and our moral uh, uh, compunction to be concerned about this. And I wanna learn more. And you never say you have to do this and so on. And so I've had to evolve myself and recognize my own bias, which again, if you can't do that, then you, you, there's no, you have no chance of being the adjudicator. Yeah, and what do you make of the lab leak thing? How has your perspective changed on that? Another great example of blindness on my part. So early in the pandemic, and I'll, and I'll, and I'll tell you why. So early in the pandemic, you know, this thing came up and it was so politicized, right? Because Trump was talking about the Chinese and all of this. Now, my wife is, Chinese by descent, right? She's American born, but she's Chinese. And <clears throat> you're reading about all these, you know, people coming up and punching an Asian person in the face. And now they're saying, well, okay, what was natural in SARS-CoV-1, this natural jump from animals to humans that resulted in a, in a outbreak, uh, didn't happen this time. This time it was engineered by the Chinese as a bioweapon and so on and so forth. And it was covered up by Fauci and so on. And I said, well, okay, this already reeks of misinformation. It reeks of a political tribal bent. And I'm listening to the authorities that I talked to even offline. And they're saying, there's really no evidence in the genome or the sequence that says that this is the case. It looks like it naturally emerged. It has those hallmarks. And I said, okay, well, you're, you, you have an expertise in this space that I don't. I don't look at the primary data on this. So I believe it. And so when people would ask me about lab leak, I'm like, guys, it's really not the thing. And can we move on? And in fact, <clears throat> what's the difference between like, you know, it, it's a wet market and, and you're torturing animals and you're eating them when, when you know, and that's causing it versus a bioengineered. It's still a man-made crisis, right? It's still something we, we ought to work on. Well, that was a blindness on my part because now more information comes out and it turns out that, oh, this is a very likely, I mean, it's as likely as anything, if not more likely, and more information comes out. And I publicly said, well, shucks, I shouldn't have been so close-minded to it. Here were, my, here were my biases. And I'm gonna tell you right now, I'm changing my mind. I think we should explore this aggressively because it just has ramifications just like the wet market did for how to prevent future pandemics and also holding some degree of accountability. And I don't think it's any more racist than saying, hey, stop eating civet cats, you know? So I, I think that, that it's a, it, it's, and it's, see like when you point these things out in me, it, even two years ago, it would have triggered a flush of emotion where I would have been like, okay, how do I defend myself against this accusation, right? And now it's almost like I get excited, like, oh, I, I was a complete asshole about this. Like I was wrong about this. This is exciting. Let's talk about why that might've been. So it's a, it's a reframing of, and, and that comes from a lot of work. That's not something that happens overnight. That's something that you pound on yourself with introspection and <laughs> meditation and reading and trying to understand your own mind, which is very hard. And I'm not even good at it yet. It's still a work in progress. I think there's a big difference between this sense of, like I think a lot of people have concerns about the vaccines, for example. I think a lot of people have um, doubts, especially in the aftermath of the lab leak and kind of realizing, wow, this, the, the consensus was so wrong around that, or at least was artificially created, even though we don't know kind of where it actually came from at the moment, or we don't know for sure. Um, there's a big difference between having doubts and being certain, and it's the certainty that is the most off-putting thing, I think, about so much of the, of the narrative. The amount that people are ready to go to war over narratives that they, they cannot be certain about, that's the thing that's terrifying, I think. It's remarkable, actually, the certainty. That, that, that's exactly, I think you nailed it in that it, that level of certainty is always now a red flag for me. Like I'm certain this vaccine is safe and effective for children. Really, how can you be certain? How can you know that? And in fact, there's a lot of evidence that says you shouldn't trust anything implicitly. You should continue to look at data and continue to question and have a nuanced answer to that, including what the authorities say. The problem is again, that distinction between public health messaging and science, and then it starts to trickle into our discourse. So you look at comment sections and it's like, absolutely ivermectin is like, you know, I've heard people say ivermectin will drive COVID to extinction from an evolutionary uh, process. And we've done math on this and it's, it's just, I'm certain that it'll do this. Well, oh, okay, really? Like, let's really get into that. And, and, and that, that, I think that's a problem I have with both sides of this. Oh, you know, everyone should get vaccinated. Well, 
Are, are you sure about that? Because there are lots of people who are low risk. We don't need them to be vaccinated to drive COVID into an endemic low level infection that doesn't bother us. Why would you take away their right to autonomy and their moral palette, which values, values liberty versus oppression, as opposed to, you know, say care versus harm or another one of these uh, moral, moral matrices? Um, or fairness versus cheating, where like people feel like people who don't get the vaccine are somehow cheating and riding on the community immunity from people who've been vaccinated. I, you know, that's all morality. It's not necessarily something that you can scientifically nail down without a lot of work that hasn't been done. So let's allow for that uncertainty. Let's, to a degree, elevate it and put it in our discourse. Now, the question is, I, and I would wonder this, do people trust people who speak in nuance or do they trust people more who speak in certainties? And I don't know if there's data on this, but I would wonder the answer to that question. Yeah, and there's also a paradox involved in even what you're doing now, like the kind of the broadcast modality of what you're doing looks like certainty. And certainty, I, I don't know whether, I think there's a difference. It's like, what, what do people trust more long-term? I would hope it's, they would trust people who are measured. It was tr They would trust people who they felt were trying to give them all sides of the story, who were bringing nuance, but certainly what cuts through is certainty, is this sort of sense of this is what I think and I'm gonna tell it to you right now. And you've got a very uh, persuasive manner, you've got a very kind of um, charismatic manner that I think it feels like you're, you're delivering truth. Like there is a kind of, like I, I hear what you're saying about that you're, you're trying to um, make sure that you're not you are delivering that nuance, but there's a weird paradox between the, the modality of what you're doing, the idiom of what you're doing, and the nature of, because when you make a statement, it feels like you're stating truth, and it's like, do you, do you see what I mean? There's a, and if probably some, someone only sees one of your videos, it's like, oh, I really like that guy's attitude, but he just, he just laid it down like it is. They won't, see the, they won't see the kind of nuance over time of you reassessing your perspectives. So that, like, I feel that, quite strongly, like there is a, an implicit tension between the broadcast modality and the nature of kind of collaborative or nuanced truth seeking. I think you bring up a very specific and good point as to this medium, which I think is very valid. And the thing is, if you're gonna do this medium, it's, it, that's one of the pitfalls because they, they may not see the arc and off, often they don't. And I get messages, angry messages about some video they saw in the past and I go, well, Hey, check this out. Because you don't go back and delete the old video, even if you disagree with it. Now, now one, one interesting thing, because, because that tension, uh, this idea that you can be persuasive, be a very good communicator, and communicate in a sense a certainty, even if you don't have it, is dangerous. It's a dangerous superpower to some degree. You see it with some of the ivermectin guys, they're very good communicators and they're very certain. You can see it with me, you can see it with others online that are very, very good. And something that happens with me that I think is interesting from an introspective standpoint is sometimes I'll do a show and I'll convey it in a passionate way. And then after the show is released, I will deeply question what I said. Like, well, mate, there's some subtleties here that I didn't convey and it comes off as more absolute than I would like. And then I can't sleep. Like I'll stay up at night going, I feel like I'm not authentically representing the nuance here. And then the next day I'll do a follow-up live show or something where I'll say, okay, so I did this show yesterday and it got a lot of traction, but I wanna clarify a few things. Now, again, the question is, do you go back and delete the show and redo it? That's not how social media works. And so you're you're violating the kind of unspoken construct on social media where you just don't go you just don't do that because that generates distrust. Or what are you trying to hide and what are you doing? You know, and it's not authentic to do that. And it's so it is a, it's something that I struggle with actually. And in this new world, how do you do this, especially if you have that persuasive ability? Um, how, how you can misuse it quite easily or, or get it wrong. You know, just get it wrong. Be so right, feel you're so right. Go out and persuade others and then cause harm. And as a doctor, that's something we're conditioned not to do. Like, please just don't cause harm. And yet we do it all the time. We do it all the time because we don't question our beliefs. We give a drug that maybe the data is not great, but you know, we were conditioned and it causes harm. But then we rationalize that we didn't do it. Well, they were gonna have a GI bleed anyways, whether I gave them this high dose non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, you know, anyways, when I should have just talked about why they're under so much stress that's causing their you know, their pain or whatever it is, you know, it's very challenging. I feel that very keenly as a, as a journalist. 
And it's one of the reasons that I've kind of avoided going too much into the data about, um, I mean, there's so many hot topics at the moment. There's so many hot topics, like Evermectin being one of them, the vaccines being another. And I felt very uneasy about going into that because I, I don't have the background. I don't have the ability to kind of do a challenging interview with, with people. I kind of been thinking, okay, how do you do that? You maybe host a, a dialogue between some people on different sides. And that's still an ongoing, an ongoing question, an ongoing thing for me. Um, but, I, but I would like to explore some of the actual topics. Um, you've kind of touched on it a little bit already. I'm actually getting my uh, vaccine tomorrow. So I would like to ask you this as a, as a kind of general question. What do, you, what do you make of kind of the concern around, say, the spike protein? Because we hear a lot about that. The mRNA vaccines, um, a lot of people have concerns. It's new technology. Isn't it kind of obviously the case that there, we, we don't know for sure whether there are unforeseen consequences by them? By definition, they're unforeseen. Yeah, of course. And if you don't if you don't admit that about a vaccine, then you're being really disingenuous. You know, uh, the truth is anything. I mean, there's so much uncertainty in any medical therapeutic. <clears throat> there's uncertainty in doing nothing. So the uncertainty in doing nothing is, well, I could get COVID. I could be one of those rare long COVID people. I could also be someone who dies. I could be someone who's fine. I could be someone who transmits it to an elder who dies. So there's the uncertainty there. I don't know what could happen. Now, the uncertainty with the vaccine actually, I think is narrower. So we kind of have seen enough people be vaccinated now, hundreds of millions, say with the, let's just stick with the mRNA vaccine for now, uh, the, the Moderna and the Pfizer versions of this. We've seen enough people be vaccinated to say, okay, here are what we're seeing. There, oh, well then people say, well, there's maybe some safety signal that isn't being pointed out. Okay, if that's true, it's probably a smaller percentage of people than you would think, because otherwise, believe me, doctors around the country would be reporting it, it'd be in all kinds of databases. But when you look at what we do catch, for example, the blood clotting, rare blood clotting syndrome with the Johnson & Johnson AstraZeneca vaccine and the myocarditis, which I think is real in the mRNA vaccines, they are caught by these uh, systems of surveillance. It's not like, you know, there's no incentive for pharma to want this information to come out, yet here it is. And so this idea that there's a conspiracy to hide this stuff, I think is, un is, is, is uncompelling. It, it may be true, but it's uncompelling. So now you're left with a situation where people talk about spike protein. Now, by, when I say people, it's usually a few folks often who, if you go to a, um, a scientific conference, there's always you know, Uncle Bob in the back who is a scientist who's in the field who proposes something that's really radically heterodox and says, you know what? You guys didn't think about this, but the spike protein itself that you're telling your cells to make with the vaccine is toxic. It is the reason why coronavirus causes disease. So why would you want people to produce it, especially if it doesn't stay in the arm and it actually circulates to the body and it accumulates in organs, which these biodistribution studies show. Well, you look at the studies and you go, no, they didn't actually show that. And actually they were looking at that early on and you don't, the average Joe doesn't have access to all this data, but the experts do. And when you talk to the experts, they say, yeah, no, we, of course we looked at that. <laughs> like that's what you have to do that when you're making vaccines. It's not like some big conspiracy to hide this, but could it be that in certain people, the spike protein generates some difficulty, including the variant of the spike that's very pure, that's made by the vaccine, which is different than wild spike type, spike protein. So these are different things. So the bottom line is, if what they're saying is true, you would expect in the population to see lots of chaos, lots of havoc. What we're seeing instead are cases plummeting where vaccines happen. We're seeing not a large safety signal. We're seeing these small safety signals, myocarditis and blood clotting in the other vaccines. And so that in itself is pretty compelling evidence to me as a physician that that's probably not true. Does that mean you shut down discussion about it? You don't look at it? You don't talk about it? No, let's have a conversation about it. You know, it's absolutely the case. Uh, you know, when Van den Bosch, this guy who was talking about, you know, the, the, the problems with vaccine in his opinion as a virologist, a vaccinologist, it's like, okay, no, don't shut him down. Let's talk about it. And I did, I did a video and I said, well, this is why I think he's full of crap, but let's have him, let's have him talk. And he can't debate me because I'm a communicator. I'm not a virologist. So I talk to the virologist and I communicate all the sides of these things. 
you got to get an actual hardcore virologist to debate him. But the problem is, again, then you get into that false equivalency of, well, the virologists are busy doing their virology. Are they going to have to do this with every single sort of fringe idea that comes out? And because that's going to be exhausting for the virologist too. So it becomes very difficult, um, but it's not impossible. It's not impossible to do. Do you think you would be able to host someone again? Like Van den Bosch, for example, has obviously got a lot of profile. He's been on a lot of kind of very high profile shows. And he's, he's a perfect example for me of where the information ecology is broken. Because I think if you talk to most virologists, they would say, he's such a fringe character, I'm not even going to bother kind of talking about it. It's like, it's too late. That genius, the genius out of the bottle. So therefore, I think that whole, I that whole idea of we can gatekeep people like that out of the conversation is, is, is wrong once it gets to a certain level. Yeah, you're right. And, 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 the, and you can't, you can't gatekeep him and you shouldn't. But the thing is, then how do we, how do we deal with this? Because when someone like that says something, and I'll tell, let, let's talk about Von Bush for a second, if that's okay, because I think his, his strategy is interesting. His case is interesting. Seems like a very smart guy, seems very well-intentioned from what I can feel through the videos. Um, he speaks in a kind of language that when I listen to it, it immediately triggers a response that says, oh, this guy is wrong. And the reason he, he triggers that is he speaks in certainties. He uses the word science about a trillion times, which is a, a appeal to authority. It's like, well, no, I'm a, as a scientist, as a scientist, the science says this is how, and the actual, the f sort of logical fallacies in what he's saying become apparent to me. So. As somebody who would spend my time, let's say I was a virologist, I'd be like, why would I, why am I wasting my time? This is just madness, like this is not it. But when, when the public hears this or someone who's sympathetic to the underlying belief that these vaccines are tools of genetic engineering that are gonna make the pandemic worse, um, it, it's, it resonates right here and it has enough science sounding stuff to feel correct. So now, this whole public health thing of like, don't deviate from the message. Well, well, now if you care about public health and you think the vaccines are helpful, you better address that. Not by banning it or putting a link saying, here's some better information. Who's gonna click on that? You, you gotta have somebody sit down and go, okay, this guy got 10 million views saying this. That means there's a good, there's probably 30 million people that believe this. So what are we gonna do about it? Well, let's get him on a show with a virologist and an adjudicator who speaks in nuance and actually sees everything as a little true but partial? A moderator rather than adjudicator, because it's yeah, not... I don't know. Yeah, the word the word adjudicator is a, is wrong. Uh, I made that up out of my you know emptiness just now. It really is a moderator or someone who's really there's no word for this yet actually because they are also a thinker. They're not they're not a completely impartial. So they would challenge in very specific ways and put their biases out on the table and that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, so that being said, you you, you kind of need that in order to uh, address that in a way that, like you said earlier, because in a pandemic there's life and death now. Like if it were just like a topic of like, well, let's talk about biodiesel versus, you know, hydrogen. Well, okay, that's not going to kill us right now. Let's, but with this, it's like, well, now people will message me and say, well, I saw this thing and I was scheduled for the vaccine tomorrow. Now I'm not getting it. And I get these messages all the time. Can you please tell me why he's wrong? And I'm like, that's out of the scope of an email. So what I tell them is something, and this, this gets back to your persuasion piece and the dangers of it, but also I think an opportunity as physicians we have. So it's this, <clears throat> listen, I tell them, this is very nuanced and complicated. I've done videos on it, but here's the bottom line. I disagree with him for a variety of reasons. It doesn't mean the questions he's asking are wrong. They're good questions to ask and you should be skeptical. This is what I've done for my family. And I know quite a bit about this stuff, but, and I could be wrong, but this is what I've done for my family. And so that's how I think about it. And in a minute, I'd like to just talk about Evermectin because that's the sort of topic du jour. Um, but before then, was thinking about how everything's very contextual. Like there's so many, there's so many reasons and so many truth claims have to be assessed on the level of context. It's often to do with how much certainty is coming from the person making that claim, whether you feel that, whether it's kind of a, there's a somatic experience, there's an empathetic experience as to whether you trust someone. Um, but there's also a, a context to, for example, the vaccine claims. So a lot of the concern about the vaccines relies on a sense that if there were problems, they would be suppressed on a big level. 
Like for me, that's disproved by what we saw very early in the pandemic in, in Europe, in particular around the AstraZeneca, AstraZeneca vaccine. They were, various countries banned the AstraZeneca vaccine quite early on because of blood clots. And there were, there were serious um, investigations into it. I remember at first there was some suggestion that it might have been a political thing. And then people were then forced to, to, to admit, no, actually, the, these are real events. The blood, blood clots are happening. So that for me shows that, OK, there may be these vast cult. It's certainly true. There are these vast forces in terms of the, the power of pharma, in terms of the, the government sort of wanting vaccination. And th these are huge forces. And we've got to be aware and suspicious about could they override public health? Could they override reactions? But what we actually saw was, no, the, the problems with the vaccines, when there were only like a few cases, they stopped using the AstraZeneca vaccine in various places. So for me, that, that, that is evidence against that suggestion. This is where you actually have to look at the empirical world and see if it fits with your, you have to truth test your ideas based on what's actually happening. Not theory, not belief. You have to go, well, okay, so what's actually happening? And the only way to truth test your claims is either to do it yourself or to have someone else in dialogue with you. Like you and I have in conversation, like I, I subtly shift my own thinking just by talking to you because I learn a little something, see something from an angle I didn't see it, right? That That's important, but we've, kind of stripped that out of the equation now because now it's these silos shouting at each other, villainizing each other and tribalizing in a way that you cannot even accept nuance. Now, what's interesting is when you see it go the other way, when you see it actually work, you're kind of, your jaw drops a little because we're so not used to it. So I have these groups of people, like I said, these subscribers who they self-select. So these are self-selecting what I call alt-middle thinkers. It's like this radical idea that it's, it's integral thinking, Ken Wilber. It's really like, hey, everything's a little true, but partial. I don't hold my beliefs so dear. I'm willing to be challenged, but I also have strong beliefs. It's not, it doesn't mean political center. It means, you know, this radical idea of questioning everything and being civil to each other and coming with good faith. So I thought, okay, maybe this is just theoretical. You know, maybe this doesn't really happen. Well, these guys self-select for people who are like this. Then you see in a closed platform, their discussions on social media, they'll share a link to something crazy and they'll have this radically open and respectful dialogue back and forth where someone comes away having learned something. It's remarkable. You don't see that on open water Facebook or YouTube comments. So I know it's possible. I know it can be done. I see it, I, it's almost like the next emergent, but it's not reached critical mass because no one's teaching it except for these radicals like Jonathan Haidt with the Heterodox Academy and you know Ken Wilber's been talking about this for decades and you know so on and so forth. Some people set a, a little standard of that and they admit when they screw it up, right? Which is hard because it's easy to fall into tribalism even after you start on that path. But I think it's there, I think it's there for us. We just need to really start to point the way and, and open to it and understand it. That reminds me of the concept of the dark forest theory of the internet, that most of the real stuff is now going on behind, like the open internet is too dangerous. The, they're mostly going on in these sort of private groups. And also reminds me, we had, a, we had a, an event on Monday in our community and there was a, a real mix. We, we touched on vaccines and there were some people who were skeptical, there were some people who were pro, but it was a very good, good faith and good natured discussion. And people felt free to express themselves. And I think that's, that's got to be the first step, whatever, whatever comes next, that people aren't shamed and aren't humiliated and aren't judged for the views that they have. Uh, that's beautiful. I mean, I get goosebumps thinking about it because you know, you get, Haidt talks about the sense of moral elevation you can get. It's this feeling of, wow, it's almost like an awe that you get when you see something that really displays truth, beauty, goodness, whatever it is. And when I see my own audience interacting with each other in a way where you know they had disagreeing opinions, but they do it in this beautiful way where they challenge each other without being hateful and they're very inclusive, it, it's a sense of moral elevation because you get this intuitive sense that that is more true and less partial than what came before it, which is this tribalized fighting. And I, I, I like you said, this dark forest idea, now that is a, double-edged sword sometimes because you can create a tribe of people that are an echo chamber of tribalism just as quickly as you can create an alt-middle tribe of thinkers that then try to go out in the world probably and- quicker. Yeah, Probably quicker. Because because one of the reasons is we've, we've um, 
we've hacked human psychology with social media now, and we've given ourselves this dopamine burst by the tribalization of the likes and the dislikes and the, the polarization and the outrage porn that we create. And it's so easy to actually manipulate that, that that's just an easy, like, man, I tell you, I could go right now and get 10 million views on a video. I know exactly the things to say. I know exact, and it'll generate me revenue. And, and it's so easy because I know exactly how social media works now in that sense. And yet it would be morally reprehensible. I wouldn't be able to sleep and it would do no good in the world. And I would want to quit um, because it's antithetical to who I've become. Now, it might not have been antithetical to who I was even a few years earlier, trying to struggle and see how do I make a living you know, doing this, how do I make my way in the world, e egocentric, like I need to prove myself, so on. Um, so again, it's, it's part of our own journey too, to try to, it's a societal journey and it's a personal journey to try to transcend this thing. Yeah, and there's one other thing I wanted to cover from my perspective as a journalist. So I kind of reflect on how I make sense of the world, how I make sense of the information landscape. You're a, you're a medical person who can look at the data, I'm, I don't have that. I don't have that skill. So what I'm doing is generally weighing what seems reasonable very quickly. Like I'm, I'm going to be wrong about a lot of stuff. But when I look at, for example, the anti-vaccine arguments and the anti-vaccine communities, and you look at there are various. Well before the pandemic, there were conferences where people like Judy Mikovits were speaking, and there's sort of these big figures within that within that ecosystem. Now. I, I am a naturally kind of heterodox thinker. I believe that there are really bad consensus positions around so many things in the landscape right now. One of the topics that I've covered, probably the, the medical topic that I've covered the most, is the overprescription of psychiatric medication and the overmedicalization of, of, of psychological distress and challenge that then leads people into being prescribed drugs and then they get into more drugs and they're in this kind of washing machine cycle. Like, and that for me fits all of the characteristics of it's kind of a big pharma conspiracy. There were um, serious people like members of the Cochrane Collaboration, which is the sort of gold standard for drugs, who've been speaking out about this and being suppressed. There was someone who, um, the name Peter Gocha comes to mind and there was another academic from I think I think Wales who was going to Toronto and was blocked from taking this post because of objections from um, effectively from big pharma companies there as well and they, they say like iatrogenic illness caused by these drugs is incredibly common it's incredibly dangerous and the catch-22 is that when you're in that system your symptoms then often get diagnosed with what you were first what you're kind of, if you entered with, with depression, it's like, oh, your depression's getting worse. It's like, well, maybe it's actually a, re a response to the cocktail of you, drugs you've been on for so long. And so I, I'm, I'm very open to the idea that there, there are these, these big societal forces and potential conspiracies. But what I see in this one, the, the kind of, um, the overprescription of drugs is the, the book, Anatomy of an Epidemic, was written by Robert Whittaker. Robert Whittaker is a Boston Globe Pulitzer Prize winning journalist. Like, and when I look at the anti-vaccine ecology, I don't see, I don't see the same credibility. And I, my general rule of thumb is truth will out. The conspiracies are not vast enough that the entire journalism industry, the entire, like everyone is in on it. And what I see for the anti -vac for, for a lot of the the vaccine the anti vaccine ecosystem to be true is that it would need a vast conspiracy. Whereas I look at I look at some entrenched systems. I look at kind of it pokes through like the truth pokes through if you're looking for it. And credible people get interested in it, start to tell that story, and that's kind of a rule of thumb that I'm sure a lot of people immediately in the comments were saying is incredibly naive, but my sense is that it pokes through eventually and the, the, the force of truth and the force of kind of genuine people looking for truth and there are enough of those even in a corrupt discipline like journalism eventually comes through. I am with you on every single thing you said, including the psychiatrist, <laughs> every single thing. And I've said this publicly that conspiracies, the real conspiracies often are exposed 
by really passionate, credible people like journalists. When you look at the kind of pseudo conspiracies that, that probably aren't true, like a lot in the anti-vaccine community, they, they're they never pointed out by these. And, and, and the thing is, again, you would need a vast, you, you would have to assume people are a lot smarter and more powerful than they actually are. Now these systems, because one of the things you mentioned about the psychiatry drugs, right? And I'm with you, I think I would say 50%, there's a theory that 30% of what we do in medicine is not helpful. I would say it's more like 50%, and it's actually harmful. Like it's not just not helpful, it's harmful. So, you know, I, I have guests on my show who are constantly talking about how do you avoid unnecessary stuff done to you? What is medically appropriate? And it's much less than you think, but you don't replace it with nothing. You replace it with this, with understanding more from a, uh, a um, psychological or spiritual or, or self-based understanding that actually the, the root is there, right? And you can actually explore that. So. These systems that have evolved, whether it's pharma, FDA, government systems, they have their own non-actor conspiracy sort of epiphenomenon where it's just by the structures of the system, the structural basis of reality is tweaked where you just are, it, you're compelled to do things this way and see the world this way. And, and until we unwind those, it's very, very hard. So that's more of a conspiracy than any a single actors going, I wanna be rich and richer and richer and richer and richer, and you know, the Bill Gates kind of conspiracy theory. It's like Bill Gates actually a lot less powerful than you think, but the systems that made Bill Gates <laughs> are very, very powerful. Um, and, and that's the thing, there aren't enough medical professionals who go out there and say, you know what, I question everything that we do because it's, you know, our medical training is a conditioning apparatus. Two years of memorizing facts, passed on from on high by a sage on the stage from no clear source, sources are not cited. It's often a bunch of old guys sitting around a table. And then the next two years are an apprenticeship where the goal is kiss the ass of the ring, uh, the attendings ring, uh, uh, so that one day you'll be the, the ring that's kissed. It's, it's, it's all about, you know, obey. The ring of the ass. It, 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 what'd you say, sorry? Not the ring of the ass thing. No, no, not, no, that ring. Well, that's just, that's just a given. You always kiss that. But then there's also this ring. And uh, yeah, all the rings. Kiss all the rings just to be safe. And, and the truth is that's how we're trained. And, and I remember I, when I was told in medical school, Demanya, you speak and then think. I'd like you to reverse that. Or better yet, just think. Because I would ask these kooky things and I try to use humor to diffuse tension. It's a terrible idea, apparently, in a very hierarchical, tradition-bound, inertia-based, fear-based profession. So it's good to question those things. Um, but... What you said, that distinction is very important because people, I think the lay public cannot tell a bogus conspiracy from a conspiracy that has potentially some legs. And that ultimately I think is the ungrounding effect of getting too deeply into conspiracy thinking is that when you start to think about it and you realize that who would need to be in on it, you, you start to lose your ground because then you're like, well, you can't trust anything. Um, and that is why I think a lot of it becomes psychoactive. But, but generally, from that perspective that I kind of sketched out about, we're all making judgments contextually. We're all making judgments based on, um, in in relation to other things. So applying that to ivermectin, which has been the, as I said, the kind of the, the case du jour, you're making your judgments based on a lot of experience within the medical industry. What do you make? What do you make of the the current situation with that? This is what I think about the ivermectin thing. So, and and it's quite nuanced. I have looked at this data, not all of it. I haven't read every single study. There's lots, there's dozens of studies out there. And a lot of them are smaller observational trials. A lot of them are smaller randomized control trials. There's sort of levels that we consider of like quality of evidence. But even at the highest level, randomized control trial, you can have a shitty randomized control trial and that, that's poorly designed, that's got confounders and all that. And it doesn't mean it's good. It can also be small, it can be underpowered. You could be asking the wrong question. Um, so there's lots of problems with data. Now that all being said, the ivermectin itself shows in vitro, in test tube activity against coronavirus and other viruses. It's an anti-parasitic. The people who discovered it got the Nobel Prize recently, even though it was discovered like years and years ago. It's off patent, doesn't generate a ton of revenue for pharma. So all those things are the background of it. Now they started trying it against coronavirus and they said, oh, this seems to work in test tubes. Then in observational trials, oh look, all the observational trials we're looking at look like they're um, 
showing benefit. In fact, pretty profound benefit. So let's keep looking. And then there's some randomized control trials. These are mostly not in the US, but around the world. And then a group of physicians that uh, kind of banded together and said, hey, this is a thing, we're using it in our practice, it's saving lives. And then they start increasingly speaking in absolutes about it and really promoting people to say, hey, come on, look at it. Pierre Corey is one of them. He goes in front of Congress and does, does this testimony and goes viral with this thing. And, and you know, even when I saw that, I was like, well, this guy speaks very, uh, like, like, again, the language he's using is quite triggering for me as someone who's trying to be this impartial learner of truth. But I said, okay, this, could well be that ivermectin works. Why are the authorities not talking about it? So you look around, you go, well, now they're not Now they're not only not talking about it, they're saying that actively, no, there's really no good evidence that this works, the quality of the evidence is poor, um, don't recommend it, so on and so forth. Infectious Disease Society of America, same thing, they look at the trials and they say, you know, not only is this evidence bad, it looks like there's a publication bias where you're only reporting positive trials because there's no negative trials. Then Pierre Corey will say, well, there's no negative trials because there's no negative results because it's so powerful. And so how do you even begin to look at this? And this is how I think about it. It's entirely possible that ivermectin has some effect. It's entirely possible it maybe even has a strong effect. With the information we currently have, I can't, I can't figure it out. And I do this a lot. I cannot answer the question. Is it safe? Mostly yes. Is it effective? Maybe. Do we need a good randomized control trial to answer this question? That would be nice. So we did that with dexamethasone, which is a cheap steroid. So we were able to do that, you know, cause some of the arguments the ivermectin guys make is you don't do a randomized control trial during a pandemic. You just give stuff that's safe. Well, this is the problem with that. There are a million stories and cases and, and things that happen in medicine where we think something works based on anecdote, observation, et cetera. Then we do the trials and they don't work. And one of those examples is this vitamin C cocktail for sepsis. You know, a lot of, I, I had the guy on my show, we talked about it, um, pros and cons. I said, well, so are the randomized controls trials coming? They are, okay, they come out, they don't show a benefit. Well, then they move the needle and say, well, they didn't truly do it right. They didn't give it early enough. They didn't do this. And then you're like, well, okay, at some point we need some arbitration of what's real here. And it, it doesn't seem like this is real. I suspect by intuition that that's what we'll see with ivermectin, but I could be wrong. And in fact, it's probably likely I'm wrong. Ivermectin probably has some effect. And so what do you have to do? You gotta study it. You never silence the people who are talking about it, but you do, you do point out where they're behaving interestingly, like these appeals to emotion, some of the logical fallacies, the moving of goalposts, the, the looking at the evidence in a way that you're just like, is that how you interpret that evidence? Cause I'm not sure this trial is very good. And let them argue with you. That's great, that's beautiful, but don't silence them. And I'll tell you, there's gonna be a thousand comments on this video when you release it that say, oh, these guys are more pharma shills that, won't, that are silencing ivermectin. I have no incentive. I want it to work. What a great idea. You give it to everybody, prevent the disease, treat the disease. You don't even, you can fill in the blanks where people aren't vaccinated or don't wanna be vaccinated. Brilliant. I would love it to work. I'm not paid by big pharma or big ivermectin, but unfortunately I just don't see it yet. So anything that we didn't cover that you'd like to cover before we wrap up? Now, I, I, I really think the, the main thing here, the takeaway for me is always, hey, we're all biased creatures. We're all tribal. We're all victims of um, these hyper stimulating technologies like social media that pit us against each other for, uh, in a way of hacking our evolution to do that. And I think if we can at least step back and say, ah, maybe there's a higher way to look at this. You can still be passionate, you can still be persuasive, but you can recognize when you have bias and actually be willing to be challenged, to challenge others. I think we do need that moderator type, that phenotype that comes out and says, hey, let's bring these guys together and let's talk about it with good faith. When we don't hate each other, why would we hate each other? We're all the same substance here. Let's, and we all, we all have the goal of like trying to help people, I think. We should assume good intent in most, most cases, right? Which is another thing we don't do. And recognize that everyone has these different moral palettes and that they're acting in a way they think is good. So please don't attack their goodness. Um, you can attack ideas in a respectful way, but so I think if we get to that level, we'll see that next evolution is just gonna catalyze. You'll see a phase shift. And then we'll be in a place where we'll be looking back on this going, man, remember when it was such a shit show? And I hope that's really, I really think and hope that's gonna happen. 
Zubin, it's been a pleasure. So thank you for making time. Really a joy. Our ability to make sense of the world is breaking down. We're making more and more consequential choices with worse and worse sense making to inform those choices, which is kind of running increasingly fast through the woods, increasingly blind. Over the last two years, Rebel Wisdom has interviewed some of the world's top thinkers. Now we've brought them together for an eight-week online course, Sensemaking 101, with Daniel Schmachtenberger, Diane Musho-Hamilton, John Viveki, Doshin Roshi, and more. Improve your sensemaking, develop your sovereignty, and join a wider community looking to do the same.